Hello and welcome back to the Shiki Science Show. So in today's video we're going to look at the pros and cons of genome-wide association studies. So before I jump straight in and tell you about the pros and cons, I'll first introduce you to what are genome-wide association studies and then after looking at the pros and cons we'll look at what polygenic risk scores are and how genome-wide association studies are used to look at polygenic risk scores. So firstly, what are genome-wide association studies? So genome-wide association studies are used to identify gene loci associated with a trait or a phenotype of interest. So the idea is that you look across the entire genome and try to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, as you can see here with T, A and G, and whether or not the T, the A or the G is associated with a phenotype of interest. So let's say people who had a T instead of an A were also had the phenotype of being really tall and so that could be a loci associated with the trait of being tall, if that makes sense. And so if you do this across the entire genome, you'll find that certain loci are more likely to be associated with that phenotype than others. And ones that surpass the threshold are of interest because it suggests that that is a loci where there is a correlation between having that uh, genetic variant and the trait. So in previous videos I've already given examples of where genome-wide association studies have been done. For example I gave an example of where it's been done with chronotype and also with obesity but this paper here is a recent paper that's also done a genome-wide association study with loci associated with same-sex sexual behaviour. And so my point is, is that they are happening all the time and can be done with many different phenotypes. But why do them? What are the benefits of genome-wide association studies? So firstly, the beauty of genome-wide association studies are that they are hypothesis-free. You don't need to know anything beforehand. And so starting from nothing, you can identify loci that have genes that are likely associated with the phenotype that you're studying. And then these genes can be further characterised and understood to understand what causes the phenotype of interest. <laughs> wow, that was a long-winded explanation. But genome-wide association studies may also have therapeutic potential, as we'll see later when we look at polygenic risk scores. And lastly, the data for genome-wide association studies requires sequencing data, which is becoming ever more prevalent and so is technically quite easy to get now or at least easier than it was previously. And these data sets can be even more informative when they're combined with other studies as well. And actually combining genome-wide association studies with other studies helps to overcome some of the limitations that are seen with genome-wide association studies. So one experiment that I mean is single cell RNA sequencing data, because with that information, you can see which genes are being expressed in a cell and which cells from a certain tissue. And so if you can see the same subset of genes being expressed as the same subset of genes identified from a genome-wide association study, you have a fuller understanding and better confidence that the genes that you're looking at are possibly associated with the phenotype that you're studying. It would make more sense probably if you had an example, but bear with me for now. But there are downsides to genome-wide association studies, the first being the keyword association. Association of a loci with a trait doesn't necessarily mean, mean causation. And so the genes that are being identified may have no real value in terms of understanding the cause of a phenotype. So the next limitation with genome-wide association studies is the missing heritability. And so what I mean by this is that if you took all the loci that surpass the threshold of being associated with that phenotype and you added them all up together, the total sum of all those loci in terms of the likelihood of you getting that phenotype condition, disease, whatever you're looking at, is only around like 2-3% to 3 maximum for most of these genome-wide association studies. So what about you know, the, the other 97%, where is this missing heritability? And so part of this issue comes from the fact that the loci with like a strong link with the phenotype aren't being identified. And that's 
comes down to a kind of a flaw, well not really a flaw, but a flaw of the genome-wide association studies, that you have your population of different uh, whole genome sequences that you're looking at, and you're trying to find loci in all of them, all of the people with the condition that have that trait, that have, <laughs> you know what I mean? And the problem is, is, if you're looking for common variants, you're going to miss the rare variants that let's say one or two people who have the condition also have that variant. And it seems possible that these rare variants are the ones that have a greater effect size, as you can see in the graph here. But there is still hope that these rare variants can be identified, given that now we have the tools to easily perform whole genome sequencing, and with this knowledge that we could be missing them, we're more likely to look for the rare variants. So another limitation with genome-wide association studies is that it often identifies loci where you have a genetic variant, but not a gene. Why are it the genes that we're more interested in because then we can understand the function of the gene, where the gene is expressed, and understand how that links it to the phenotype. And so certain reasons could be that the low size in a non-coding region, in which case it could be affecting the expression of not just one gene, but multiple genes that altogether could be influencing the phenotype. Um, there's also linkage to equilibrium, whereby there might be more than one gene in that same region. And, or there's, so it's more to do with the fact that there could be multiple variants within a certain uh, low sign it's determining which of those variants is responsible. And then lastly, it's looking at which tissues um, are important in terms of the gene. So as I said, there might be a gene that you've identified, but it might only be expressed in certain tissues. And so to get answers to these different points, you need to combine genome-wide association studies with other experiments, such as the RNA sequencing data that I spoke about earlier. And another important issue that is now being better addressed is the lack of diversity in the studies at the moment. So a lot of the genome-wide association studies have used sequencing data from mainly European populations. And so by including this, uh, including more ethnicities into these studies, could also explain why there seems to be a lack of heritability in the results. And so it would be valuable to include them. And so if some of these limitations can be addressed, there's great excitement for genome-wide association studies for being used to generate polygenic risk scores, whereby they can take your genetic information and look at which genetic variants you've got, and therefore your risk or likelihood of uh, getting a certain disease or phenotype. And so this could be the likelihood that you could get a certain type of cancer, and this predictive information could enable better um, identification and early identification of certain diseases, which will lead to better time available for treatment. And so by taking body mass index as an example, the greater your polygenic risk score, the greater the prediction of your BMI is. And so if you did this across a population, you would see a bell curve for the distribution of risk scores. And so the risk score could have some kind of predictive value for assessing people who are at high risk of having a high BMI and getting obesity, and therefore could be targeted through effective treatment. But that's the key thing that I need to emphasize. It's about whether or not a risk score can be actionable. And so this was actually already done in a recent paper, whereby they used a genome-wide polygenic risk score to quantify the inherited susceptibility to obesity. And they did this to see if they could identify adults at risk of severe obesity. And the idea is that if you can, then um, you can try and help to prevent that from happening. But the other key thing is that these polygenic risk scores have to be independent of other information that you can already get. So if you were going to help somebody and that person was already obese, then getting a polygenic risk score that tells you that they're going to be obese is, isn't really going to be much help then, is it? Because it's already going to be obvious. Um, so it's all about whether or not polygenic risk scores 
are going to be actionable and can be independent of other sources of information that we can already attain. So I hope this video has given you a good introduction to what genome-wide association studies are and their benefits and the current limitations with them, but also what we can do with them. So thanks for listening.